I'd like to welcome everyone today to this week's edition of Long In, um, Imperials, Imperial as One's interview series where we explore the, exp the experiences of BAME individuals. Um, this week, we have the pleasure, the privilege, it's a slight diversion to our normal, where I normally just have one person who I interview because this week we've got the privilege of having both Judith Jacobs and also Suzette Llewellyn, two British actresses who you'll probably recognize from their number of um, different roles which they've played from EastEnders to No Problems but I'm not going to go into all of the, the the wonderful things that they've they've done because they're going to tell us about it in a few minutes and it's just really good to have them here with us today um, we're going to have a real candid conversation discussing about um, their careers as actresses and the things that they've done what's motivated them and what projects they're working on at this moment in time so I'm going to hand over I don't even know who to pose the first question to right because I've got two of them on this time so can you give us a little bit about your backgrounds and um, how you got into acting and um, how your motivations so i'm gonna i don't know who to start with since we've got judith in the picture first we'll start with judith yeah, with, her, with her name at the back judith yeah. jacob judith jacob so you don't get it wrong yes no S, judith jacob judith <laughs> right that's right it's my pet hate it's no s, <laughs> Susan, no no s. s. Yeah. Oh, i'm having no a s Right, let, sorry, I will amend that, sorry. <laughs> oh, Wayne. Um, That's okay. Yeah, but Judith can start. Okay, Judith. Yeah, thank you. It was, I thought it was very funny that Susan put in the chat, no S on my Jacob. I spent my whole primary school going, Jacob, Jacob, no S. I don't know why it upsets me so much, but from primary school, that has been a pet hate of mine. I Maybe think it's because you I didn't want to be a cream cracker. Jacob's cream crackers. I was about I think to say, <laughs> if I was in the cream cracker family, wouldn't I have some of the best smokers in my family? That doesn't <laughs> sound right in lots of levels. But anyway, <laughs> Tim. So um, at a very, very young age, I wanted to be an actress. When I say young primary school, I wanted to be an actress. And my parents were like, who you see on television that look like you, they actually want to be actress. And then my mother bought me this book on Hollywood. Right. And it shows you this woman who said she had to get up. It was like a column thing. She had to get up at five o'clock in the morning, get to makeup, sit in makeup. And she didn't finish till 10 o'clock. And my mum knew how lazy I was. And she knew that this would be a deterrent. But I was like, oh my God, she spent all day acting. I got to do this. So it did not work the way she thought it was going to work. <laughs> and I'd done every single play in my primary school. Then when I went to my secondary school, the Star Class in Islington, I was told about a place called Anna Shear Theatre. And, or well, Anna Shear Drama School, that's what it was at the time. And so I, to join it was a six month waiting list for to me that was forever but actually later on it became a three year waiting list I got in quite early and I had an audition when I was 13 for a BBC play for today which was originally called Slag Bag but because it's BBC they had to change the name so it was changed um what was the change from slag bag it went to oh gosh, i should remember it i can't remember it. and it was a much more safer title and i was it i was 13 so i'd done that play and then after that i because i was at school we had to, there was a thing when you were at school you had to go and get weighed every time and you can only work so many year, days in a year as child actress which i never thought of myself as those words yeah. now as an adult i was a child actress Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> carried on carried on and then I was doing my A levels and I went for an audition for a series called Angels which was a nurses series yeah. I was 17 the, the trajectory from my family's point of view was that I was going to go to university right. because I was really the first one in my family to do that yeah. however Angels meant that I would have had to leave school 
So it's either I stayed at school and went and do what the family expected of me, or I left to do angels because it was a three year stint to do. And my mum said to me, this is what you've wanted, go for it. My dad was like, no, education, education, education first. My mother died on the night of the showing of my very first episode. My mum died that night. I was in Birmingham. And then, um, but my dad had a t-shirt of mine that could barely fit him, that he was walking around all over the place. My data, my data with <laughs> angels written on it. So from telling me I must leave, I must um, leave and go and do this work. I must stay in my education. He was the proudest man on the vi- in the, the proudest man in the village, I should say. <laughs> and that was my journey in Texas. Oh, brilliant. That's excellent. So it was, it was a childhood dream, which was made into a reality just by... But you said that you went to a drama school. Okay. Um, how did you... No, talk- it was Anna Shears in the evening. It was in the evening. It was... Yeah, Anna's was like... Anna's was the... People like me who could not afford to go to stage school. Right. But she was an outline. So myself, Pauline Quirt, Pauline, Pauline Quirt, Linda Robson, Bill Daniels. Um, there's quite a few of us that come from the stable of Anna Sheer, who we were all working class people, couldn't afford it. We went there in the evenings. We went there twice a week. Yeah. And then when you started to get work, you were put into called the professional group, which was on the Friday. And right. everybody wanted to be in a professional group because that meant you were now an actor. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. That was, but what, what, what you said from, from very early on, it was like a very burning ambition from very early on that you knew you wanted to be an actress. What was it? What was it about the lights, the camera? What was it that, that, that was the attraction for you? I think as an actor, probably being somebody else, just that luxury of being somebody else. But also I fell in love with Betty Davis and Joan Crawford as people on the screen. Little did I know about the feud between them. Imagine they were the two that I fell in love with and they had the biggest feuds going on. But there was something about them, particularly Betty Davis, that I just went, I want to be like that. Yeah. And that was that I just wanted... I think when we're young, uh, we were our imaginations were so we played. We, our imagination was wild. We didn't have all these screens that we could watch and and things. So we made stuff up. We were constant doing stuff as children, making up your own dramas, making up your own little things, doing puppet shows. We didn't have no light, so you the, the candle light. You'd done your little puppet shows. So we were always being creative, and 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 that was the outlook for me. Not singing because I didn't think my singing voice was as good as Suzette's. Okay. Okay. <laughs> in joke, unless you know you would have known. <laughs> well, I think everybody's going to know now. You're trying to throw word after me, isn't it? <laughs> She's trying to throw word after me. Don't worry, Judy. Don't worry. I, I think that might be a good segue into asking Suzette then for her experiences, because it's slightly different. To, I'm assuming it's going to be slightly different, or it might be the same as, as Judith. So, Suzette, how... Yeah, how... I mean, they're, they're pretty... I'll let gonna, you ask your question before I, was I answer say, it. How, 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 how was your journey into becoming an actress? Um, there are lots of similarities. I mean, I come from a big family mm-hmm. and I was always the one who was telling the stories, um, making little games, organising sports things, organising things. I, I, I just love bossing my, my siblings about and making them do things and playing games. So, you know, when you're a kid, I was always the director, basically. Like, right, the milkman's gonna come, right? You go outside the door and then I come inside here. And when we come in, you're gonna tell them to do this. And then what's gonna happen is she's gonna have robbed that, but nobody's gonna say anything. So I realized, I mean, later on, I realized that I was always that linchpin doing that. Um, I also really enjoyed art. Um, I love drawing and I do remember being at, um, and it was my infant school in, cause we lived in Nottingdale to begin with before we moved to, my parents bought a place in Chiswick and it was Avondale school. And I remember one of my friends, a couple of my friends lining up for me to draw them a flower. Cause I always enjoyed um, just creativity, mm-hmm. but I, I loved that. And at primary school, I didn't, I didn't play all the parts at primary school. I remember they had, a, they were going to be doing a pantomime and it was Aladdin 
and I really wanted to be the, you know, be Aladdin or be the big genie. And I didn't get that part. I got the part of the genie of the ring and I was really a right little show off. So I made sure I had, I didn't have a great, I think I had two lines, but I made my costume. I had all these scarves tied up along my arms. I had this massive costume and I remember the teacher trying to help me untie the scarves from my arm because I pulled them too tight. Those very light, um, they weren't really chiffon, they were nylon scarves that yeah. people used to, they were very popular in the 70s yeah. amongst women. And I had loads of those just tied to my arms and I made this big thing of my, my, um, my appearance as the genie of the ring. Um, when I was in secondary school, I had a very, very supportive English teacher, right, um, Claire Thompson, right. who was very supportive mm -hmm. because uh, the school was like a sort of, it had changed from being a grammar school into a secondary school. Right. And basically it, the clear lines were there in just fair enough. There were some parents who sent their children there because it was a secondary school. It was sort of this new thing. So they were quite liberal some middle-class liberals there. And there were other kids who were just basically marked down as factory fodder and they were gonna to go to the um, local brewery and work there. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, so it's a kind of funny mix still because we had some teachers from the old days when it was a grammar school who thought that everyone was gonna to go to hell in a handbasket because it wasn't a grammar school anymore. Mm -hmm. And other newer teachers coming in who um, were thinking of this experiment and how it was gonna work. But it wasn't a great school academically, but there was a lot of art and a lot of drama. We had music, we had a lot of music festivals and things like that. So um, that was great. And then I joined a little local um, local group that we met on Tuesday nights, W um, Theatre West 4, which was started by an amateur um, a woman who was very keen on um, uh, drama in the area. And her husband was a solicitor, a local solicitor, and she started this group. Yeah. So that was where I was able to get that kind of feeling and grounding. And then with that, plus my teacher's encouragement, um, I applied for um, National Youth Theatre right. and Cockpit Theatre and then eventually Drama School. Because my parents didn't really know anything about that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so she was the person when I got into Drama School and I said, well, I've got into these drama school. She in fact helped me find my pieces right. to okay. audition. She, I mean, she really was an old fashioned teacher who sees an interest in a child mm -hmm. and develops it. And yeah. I, I don't want to be cynical, but I don't think you have enough of those teachers anymore. Yeah. I yeah. hear about, there are some, but you don't have enough of those. And in the same way that things like Judith going to Anna Cher or me going to that local drama group that was started by somebody who was interested in drama and had, had this kids group, those people, those things are really important because that extracurricular stuff is really important because that's where you're going to learn something about yourself and um, as, a, as a young person, as a child, and what your abilities are and what you like, what you enjoy. It's from these things you're going to learn a lot. Because um, I, I really think the education system's um, yeah. is bust, basically. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's very... too much about, it's too much about getting people to regurgitate something to put down a piece of paper, rather yeah. than helping them to understand how to learn or yeah. using their mind in a yeah. certain way. Um, so then I went to drama school, which was a total culture shock. Mm -hmm. um, I went to, I mean, I, I was, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a black young girl, and also as somebody coming from London, being working class, it was a total culture shock. Mm -hmm. And I found it very difficult. And also coming from the background I came from, my parents were from Jamaica, and in lots of ways, they were trying to keep Jamaica in their household, mm -hmm. in the way we were brought up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was still, I went when I was seven, eight, 17, just 17, and I um, wasn't used to calling adults by their first name even. Mm -hmm. So to <laughs> me, to call an adult Jane or whatever, it's like, oh, it was hard because I didn't see, I, was, I hadn't been trained or taught to, to speak yeah. on a level with, with adults. Yeah. You know, they had to be auntie and they were better, you know, so that, that was something to work at. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But I, I did have that inkling, it was that thing. I think it's also storytelling. Yeah. Very strongly storytelling and a little bit of sort of wanting to be in front of people and, and entertaining them. Yeah. Um, so it sounds to yeah. me, both of you had very, from, from, from what you've said, you had both encouraging parents. Your parents w w were supportive. Well, 
kind of supportive. Um, well, yeah, no, I think they were. I mean, my father, I definitely remember he he felt that he was a wage slave. Right. And he did what he did to make. And I think he wanted us, if, if, if I'd have come in and said, maybe I wanted to be a shoemaker, I feel that my dad would have said, all right, then you make the best shoes. Yeah. Because he wanted us to have something soulful because he really was into music and that's something he would have liked to have pursued. Yeah. But he wasn't able to in lots of ways. And then when he had all the kids, it was like, it was like, no, stop that foolishness yeah. Yeah. and yeah. get on with earning the money. Yeah. <laughs> but it, both of you have both mentioned about the fact that you had a teacher who was there to support you, right? And and I can clearly hear from, from yourself, Suzette, how that has um, influenced how you see the education system itself and and how it can kind of like help to propel people into their sense of belonging identity and their abilities to achieve um, within the system. What, now, Judith said about her big, her first break coming with the, the show as a, as a child actress, right? When did you get your break? <laughs> when did you get your break into- well, um, yeah. Well, my break came actually just before I left drama school. I auditioned for, can you hear me? Yep, we can now. Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Great, okay. Um, the Northumberland Theatre Company. Mm -hmm. And I was really fortunate because back in the days, um, you had to be, a, to get an acting job, you had to be a member of a union, right. of the equity union. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't a member, you couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, you couldn't get a job unless you were a member. So it was really difficult. How do you get a job if you haven't got an equity card? And how do you, you know, it just was very difficult. Yeah. Companies used to get, I think they got two two cards a year. Is that right, Judy? I didn't get my card like that. I found out afterwards how you can get a card. But yeah, it, yeah but you didn't I don't need know, to, it, it was you, very hard. You went straight to television. So you got, they sorted that out for you. Yeah. But I think theater companies used to get like two cards a year. And right. of course, they are looking, they're not giving them out willy nilly. Yeah. And it was really difficult. You heard yeah. all sorts of stories, how people were trying to get this precious equity card. So I got this job playing Viola in Twelfth Night for the right. Northumberland Touring right. Company. And I went up to Northumberland, which again, for somebody coming from London, a really urban girl, I didn't go, you know, too far out of my own area even. It was quite a culture shock. So that was my break, playing Viola in uh, Twelfth Night. And that was a real eye-opener. Also, just being in the country, being in Northumberland. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I had never seen so many stars before. Mm -hmm. I looked up in the sky. I mean, I thought I saw stars in London, but you looked up in the sky. No, no, you've got further away. Oh. Sorry. Um, you looked up in the sky and there was like scores of stars. And, and it was black. The night was dark, dark, dark. So it was incredible. Yeah. It was just incredible. Yeah, so that was, to me, it was a, it was a real eye-opener in so many ways, that first job. So I'm going to address this one to, to Judith. How have you found, in, in the time where both of you, I suppose, have been in the acting profession, how have you seen things changed with regards to representation of, of Black people within these different within this in, within that environment, because um, I remember Judith. I remember watching you in Angels, and I remember seeing you in No Problems and East Enders. Right, East Enders. I remember you on the East Enders. How was that for you as a as a young black woman um, in in that particular at that particular time? Uh, for me, as a young black woman, I was I was so like tunneled vision mm -hmm. and because I happen to have got work I, I got work I would go back to back work and it wasn't that it was weird I don't think there was that many of us at that time right in the business so it made it easier and I was watching an interview with Denzel Washington the other day and he was being interviewed and he was he was young and he was talking about was saying oh as a young black man how did you find he goes well you know, I, I don't see any problem out there. I've been working very well. And what would you say to a white actor when they have problems getting an acting job? And I thought, my goodness, that's how I sounded when I was younger. Because when you're working, everything is okay. 
Right. You don't see everything else around you. And so actually I went from one job to another job to another job. Mm -hmm. And there seemed to be continuity. I seemed to be projecting to be carrying on and doing the profession I've always wanted to do. Then you get to a point where you there is no longer a continuity. There's like if I was a, a an actress, a white actress of a certain caliber, let's say same, same, same person, me, but white, mm -hmm. I feel that I would have been offered other jobs. I would have been put into places to be seen for other things. But it's only as I've got older, I would say that. When I was younger and I was working, ugh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm doing okay, Jack, thank you very much. Yeah. But as you've got older, you've realized, and, and other people's journeys, you've realized that it's not that we have all had the same journey. Yeah. And and it's been, and, and also I've seen, I did, I did a lot of things because I was okay. And it's only that I've seen Oh, question things that happened when I was young and I go, oh, oh, wait a minute, Jude, that was, that wasn't good, was it? So for me, when I was younger up until probably Real McCoy, I was working quite consistently yeah. and then it became much more sporadic and not as often as I was before. Mm -hmm. You know, we can use all excuses. Maybe my talent is no longer as good as it was. Who yeah. knows? Uh -huh. But I do feel that there is. <laughs> Don't believe me. We have. We all have this fault syndrome thing that we're not real pretenders of the throne. Especially when you keep going yeah, yeah, with jobs, yeah. and you don't get it. <laughs> you start thinking maybe, maybe. And yeah. then when I had one of my work, I've had two really bad periods. One time I went to BB Crew. We have a company together, myself, Susan, and four other actresses. And I came in feeling really low and going, oh, this is a really bad. And I said to Suzette, oh, and then Suzette took my pain over. So I thought, okay, but that's the beauty of having other people because you're thinking you're on your own. Only you feel like this. And I'm blessed that I've got these other women that I can go I literally vomit out how you feel and they just take it up, throw it in a bucket and come back and go, all right, come, you're okay. This is how we all feel like this. <laughs> Um, so that yeah so that definitely um happens and the other one when I was feeling really like I'm just rubbish so, something that I was real McCoy I think was somebody threw whatsapp to me and I went oh no you're okay dude you can do this job yeah. so sometimes you just need to be reassured because it is that you I tell people go to me oh I want to be an actress what, what would you say I say learn rejection if you can't take rejection walk out the door do not even bother yeah. trying to go in this profession because if you can't take rejection then you're just gonna die <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I understand yeah. i understand it's that resilience it builds up resilience in you but i, I think one of the things which i just hearing from that was because i know when i've spoken to yourself and when i spoke to suzette the other evening i could automatically see and feel the bond that you have between you Right. And yeah. I, I recognize that there was it was it was a playful bond between you, a loving, sharing, caring bond. Right. And that. Yeah. How much that's come that? over years. That has come over yeah. years because right. we have we had a theater company together. And also, I mean, taking up on what Judith was saying about um, continuity. What's happened? We've lost frozen because she's traveling. Right, can consistency. You, I, it's very difficult if you look at things like Monroe and Mona Hammond and and um, Cor, um, Cor, Cor, um, Corin, Corin Skinner Carter, those people. Can you guys yeah. still hear me? You dropped out for a second, but we can yeah, hear you. Oh, yeah. Great, okay, yeah. fine. Those people who were working prior to us, where the parts were very scarce, they mm -hmm. were far and few between. So we had an opportunity, there were parts they were still kind of sporadic. You weren't able to say, plan like, all right, I'm going to do a play this year. I'm going to do a play this month, and then I'm looking to, I'm going to hopefully I'll get a play here. I'll get a television thing. I'll get this. You weren't able to do that, mm -hmm. and that was directly because of the fact of the barrier, because of the way that people were casting things. Mm -hmm. They would think, what reason do I have to mm -hmm. have this person of African descent in this, rather than to think, what reason have I got to have that actress? play this because this actress would be right for it that I think is turning and you see more work happening for people and there are more people doing things themselves so one of the things that we did as a group of actresses there were seven of us was form our own company right the BB crew 
which was start it was was it round it was in the early eight in the early 90s yeah and so 90s, we yeah. yeah early 90s we wrote produced our own work mm -hmm. we toured the uk we went to america with mm -hmm. one of our shows we basically created our own work um and that was something that was really really important but that was i mean so we've known each other how many years now june but you didn't have no children <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't have children then. That's true. That's true. No. Two of them, Janet, Kay, and Judith, they both had kids. That's true. But how many years? It was like, oh, God, my God, yes, I didn't have any children. So, yes, my daughter's, and you know, my eldest is 22. So, we're looking at nearly right. 30 so years. So, it's more than that. It's about 30 years. It's more years. than 30 years. Wow. So, yeah. basically, that rapport you're talking about, that's built up over yeah. that amount of time. But and yeah. And it's important that you have people like, and in this, particularly in this industry, when you're also talking about your, not just your ego, but that level of resilience that you need yeah. and um, community and belonging, you really yeah. need that yeah. because it's really, it's just vital. And so you need to have people who are by you, as Judith says, who understand, but also can help. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you need a little slap. Somebody has to say, all right, that's enough now, <laughs> or you're not in the right track or somebody yes. say, yeah. Or sometimes you just need someone to put their arm over you as yeah. well. You need you need both of those things. So I, I like that idea about that critical mass. The, 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 there were seven of you, but that was enough for you to get that sense of belonging, that sense of identity, that sense of camaraderie, that support network for when things weren't going well. Mm. You had people who you could turn to. They became almost like your family an extension to your family, yeah? You, yeah, you, absolutely, I'd say yeah. yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, uh, and and especially when you are you find yourself being almost like, I'm not saying the only one, but one of very, very few people in the environment which you're working in, you really do need to have those resilience jackets, as it were. Your friendships becomes your resilience jackets. They're the yeah. ones who hold you together. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah. I think that's a great way of um, of putting it. Resilience jackets, because, uh, yeah, it's almost like you, you need that to just march in and keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Most definitely. Also, Suzette's husband said something when I was going through my lot of, oh, this, this business is rubbish. And he went, no, stay. Because it, the, let the others leave, and then we're just you left. I went, yes, I like that. I'm staying. I'm staying. <laughs> <laughs> Got to play the long game. <laughs> long game. Got to yeah, play, play the, the long, long game. game. <laughs> that's that's brilliant. I, no, I, I, let everybody else leave. Go on. <laughs> No, that's, that's it. Can you give me, from, from, can you both give me one example or one illustration of a, what you think was a really high point? I'm not saying that your careers aren't, there isn't more to come, but so far, what would you say has been one of the things which you look back on with real fond memories? Actually, for me, it's couple. absolutely, without a doubt, well, for me, it's without a well, there are a couple actually, but one of them was flying over to New York with the theatre company that I had founded, co-founded with them, the members of that theatre company who were also my friends, flying over to New York to go and do the piece that we'd created there. For me, that was just, I mean, I was on the plane and I'd recently just got married and I said to the girls, I said, if I die now, I'll be just so happy I'd have died happy. <laughs> Because to me, that was like, boom. Brilliant. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, that's one of my ones because we did go in over. Honestly, it was, and it almost felt like this is what it's meant to be. It, it, you know, it happens quite well for us as well, didn't it, Suze? It wasn't like we had to work like, Absolutely. Off. They asked us fantastic. to come over. Yeah. We were invited. It was so brilliant. It was, really it was wonderful. Empowering. Yeah. And we've done workshops. It really was. And it, it was, and so that was an amazing thing to do. And on the same yeah. level would be no problem for me <sighs> because I was working yeah. with my family, my friends. And we every day we went in, we had a card game called Speed and we would play this game and they would go, can you come and rehearse? We're like, what? So we, 
it was like we came to meet each other as opposed to come to work. <laughs> so I loved it. And also when we came back from America, I'm going to give a bit of insight about us, Suze. We were, on, we, were, yeah. we were meeting at the airport. It was in New York we were meeting at. And um, Suze was yeah. phoning everybody, you've got to come meet us. We, we got to, when you get there, you've got to ask to see this man because Suzette talked to everybody. She finds some man who's Jamaican who fell in love with the fact that she is Jamaican in America. <laughs> got us into the what lounge was it? The VIP lounge or something? Oh, God, and we yes, were yes. never seen this before. So, we, yes, so we were able to drink wine in this lovely glass and all this food before you got on the plane, and yeah, then we had champagne in little bottles for the whole journey. Me and Suze did not go to sleep because we're so greedy. <laughs> we did not want to miss out on being able to drink. <laughs> it was fabulous, yeah. Yeah, very, very, yeah. Well, Those because things, of Suzette you... talking. Because she likes to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those things though. The things where you create and it's your own. Those are things that they're just valuable. That's what it's about. Yeah. You know, telling your stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're working now on things that, yeah, yeah. that, I mean, and of course we're working on them, so we're not going to speak about them yet, but yeah, we are working cool. on stuff. Yeah. And doing more stuff. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. Because I, I yeah. I, you, you kind of like stole my, my next question, because I was going to say, what, what, what's, the, what's the future direction for the company? Because I've, someone in the, um, on the chat has just said, we didn't know about this, this, this company. Let me ask, this is going to be kind of like a little bit of a controversial kind of thing. In terms of support from the community, right, when you were putting on your plates, mm. did you get the support um, from the community? Oh, overwhelmingly. Okay. Overwhelmingly. We had a huge, in fact, I went to the bush last year to a show and there was a young lady working behind the bar and, well, the bad the downside of the story is it just reminded me how old I am and she said to me oh so I, I saw you my mum took me to see the BB crew at Hackney Empire and I thought and she was like about seven or something at the time and she's now old <laughs> enough to be surfing behind a barge the big grown woman and I think I'm her age but yeah so that was um but yeah but so yeah we had it was fantastic we had an incredible audience um, and it sustained us for quite a few years while we were doing that show and then another show so we had a great audience things happened in our lives I mean obviously it came a point not not obviously but it came a point in our lives where things were changing yeah um, if we'd have been sort of a bit younger like in our 20s we'd have probably all lived in a house eaten soup and just got on with it but yeah. because it came at that point we weren't in our 20s we were like in our early 30s and things are changing you know you're settling down with partners having children that happened so it kind of just at that time we hadn't we thought about it, we hadn't thought of a way of how to make that work because if that had been on our agenda on our mind I'm sure we had enough um, power in ourselves to have made it work with children but we didn't we hadn't seen a model and we didn't yeah. create that model yeah. in that way do you know what I mean because I do think sometimes you don't see the model so you think to yourself mm, I'm going to create it but yeah. we weren't there yet at that yeah. time but we did have, and an, an women, uh, the black community. I mean, I remember there was a woman from Canada one time, Judith, do you remember she came and she was like, we had a sketch where we had all the little girls um, with that we, we were playing little girls playing out, just playing together. We all had cardigans on yeah. our head and we're swishing them and doing stuff. And it ends up with one being spiteful and pulling off the cardigan off another girl's head. Um, anyway, she came up and said, and it was a white woman, she said, she said, oh, I used to do that because I wanted long hair. Mm -hmm. Whereas we thought that it was just us doing it. It was a black thing, as, um, yeah. With, yeah, as black, because we wanted long hair because our hair wasn't, but this was the thing, she wanted to do that too. So mm -hmm. there were so many stories that just connected with people in so many ways, but we were very well supported, supported by the community. Absolutely, we really were, Brilliant. yeah. That's, that's excellent. What I normally do at this point is, ask if there was any questions from the audience because I know between the three of us we could fill an hour two hours quite easily right but I'm yeah. gonna just open it up we gotta go <laughs> if, yeah. if there are any questions from anyone in the audience otherwise I'm quite happy to keep asking questions does anyone in the audience have any questions at this time 
Okay. Um, oh, someone's coming on. No, okay. So one of the other questions which I've got, because a friend of mine, um, his daughter is in a theatre company. She and they, they last year they put on a play at it was quite interesting when you were talking about the Cockpit Theatre. In it, 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 was that the Cockpit Theatre in North London? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, because she, Marylebone, yes, yeah, 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 Cockpit Theatre, yeah. Marylebone, yeah. yeah. Um, I remember going there to see the play that they had written and they had written and, and starred in and it was a, about a, a salon and it, it, it wasn't, it was set in a salon but it was looking at different elements of sexuality, um, of the black experience, colorism, all of those things and it was a really, really powerful, um, a powerful play. But I was just thinking about what what you both just said with regards to um, being in your early 20s or in your early 30s and having what was a successful theatre company, but not knowing how to then make it, not, not know how to, but not necessarily having people around who could advise you as to how to make it sustainable for a long term, especially when things around you are changing. Um, so I suppose my question would be, what advice would you give to say my friend's daughter, who's kind of like in her early twenties, right? They've got a nice little theater company themselves doing some really nice plays. What advice might you give to that young person? Just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, just keep doing what yeah, you're doing. Definitely. Keep writing, keep doing your story, getting them out there. Just keep, the most important thing is to keep doing the work. Right. Um, audiences will come. And now there are lots of, there are platforms. There are many more platforms now. I mean, I mentioned this the other night when we had a brief talk. I was talking about the Million, um, million Youth Media, it's called. Mm -hmm. And basically, if you go on YouTube, you see they are producing lots of different <coughs> films and short films and pieces. They're going out there. I mean, kids now, I mean, they've got, a, they've got a camera in their pocket when they've got their iPhones and they're making and creating their own work. So I would just encourage people to keep doing that. That's what you have to do. Keep building your audience, keep building um, your stories, keep telling them because you don't want to wait. You know, sometimes people say, oh, well, we haven't got this. No, you make it. If you haven't got it, you do it. If you don't see something you want there, you create it. Um, yeah, and I think that's what you have to do. But you have to have had the mind to think that's what you want. Do you know what I mean? You might not know what to create or get guidance on how to create it because you're not sure that's quite what you want. You're not sure what it is that you want. But if you want to hear a story, it's like they say, Toni Morrison, I think, said, you know, if, if there's a book you want to read and it isn't there, you write it. And also with personalities, because the thing about when you're working with a group of people is that, so, I mean, when we were younger, there was definitely ego involved because, you know, we're all stars in our own rights. But with, you know, with the, the things coming your friends are in stuff, you're talking, that it, listening is really important so that you may think that your idea is the only idea, However, other people also have ideas. So just be open enough to listen to what other people are suggesting and, 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 and take the ego back because it's not, it's hard to do what I'm just saying. It, you have to get, I've got there now. That's taken me a long time. So I'm trying to say it now that when you're with a group of people to actually, before you shut it off, listen, because sometimes you may go, uh, that that works or we can collaborate with the ideas so that's the other thing when you work with other people it's really important that you've got to learn to listen to what other people's points of views are on stuff and that's what makes it better that's the beautiful thing is that when you listen and you work it out together you actually get a much better product than if you want to just drive your single idea through yeah absolutely totally and that is sometimes something that you have to just learn with experience and age. Yeah. I've lost your sound. Is it just me? 
So the act is... No, I think I, I've lost Wayne now? too. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're right. back now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the acting, it's not just about acting, it's more about the listening. It's more about thinking about hearing, it always is. hearing, seeing and absorbing, taking in all of the um, cues from around and then putting those out into something which is creative, recreating um, the narrative as it were in a way which you want it to be packaged. I've got one question. Yeah, I'm not sure absolutely. if they want to come on. Um, Zara, would you like to ask your question or do you want me to? Um, yeah, it was just in general, just a discussion point really. Just what do you think of representation today in, in acting? Do you think there's good diversity or yeah, what are your feelings? Thanks, Zara. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm very excited by the, oh, sorry. No, carry on. Oh, great. You were asking if there was, if I thought, what, what, what was diversity like now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, I, I see lots, I was speaking about this, I see across different platforms, um, you know, I see it on YouTube, people creating things. I see, you speak about your friend, Wayne, mm -hmm. who has, yeah. um, or your daughter's friend who has a theatre company. Yeah. I see other people starting things. There are groups, there's Galvem. There's lots of different groups doing lots of stuff. And I think that's exciting. People basically taking up um, their um, opportunity to create art. Mm. And I'm seeing a lot of that. And I think that is great. I mean, in lots of ways, we can be quite blinkered thinking the only representation there is, is what we see on a box that we used to see on a box. The television where people don't even watch things in the same way they used to anymore mm. you know and there's lots of stuff everywhere i mean yeah there's always more but just keep just keep feeding on what there is i mean i live over in west london in hammersmith they've got this huge display in um in a square it's called lyric square of just what black art means and they've had that yes it was for black um, history month but it's been there the whole month it has books, it has artists' work showing, and it's a fantastic display. I think it's great. It's yeah. just a, a, a screen that comes up and showing stuff. So there is, you just have to keep, we just have to keep doing it. Yeah. We're here, we're not going anywhere, just keep yeah. creating Yeah. and keep positive. Yeah. That attitude that Julie spoke about that Denzel had was like, well, yeah, well, why wouldn't anybody give me something or do whatever, you know? It's like that Zora, um, Zora Neale Hurston, when she said, when she hears somebody is like prejudice, and this was like in the 20s, I think she said it. Mm -hmm. I just think, why would someone want to deprive themselves of my company? I'm so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this was a woman, you know, in America in what, the 20s and the 30s, just saying, yeah, well, I don't understand, they're an idiot because I'm so wonderful, you're depriving yourself of me. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I think sometimes we have to look at it that way. <laughs> I do like that. I do like that. And yeah, I've got to find the properly and send it to you. Yeah, definitely. That would be brilliant. Um, I suppose... Yeah. Yeah. Just Zora going... Neale Hurston, yeah. Zora Neale Hurston. I'm just thinking about all of the, the wonderful things that you, you've done. I, my highlights, I do remember... I do remember watching The Real McCoy and just just laughing so much. It was amazing how funny that, that show was. Um, or is, not just was, is you know, um, and it's been, I, I, I know I could talk to the two of you independently uh, and uh, there's so much more that we could unpack. I suppose just going forward, on that. if there was one thing that you'd like to see changed or one thing that you'd like to see going forward, what would it be? One thing going forward into the future either for yourself, for your family, what, what would it be, um, especially like now with the COVID and, and everything like that, what would you like to see as a, a black community going forward for us to achieve? I would really, really like there to be a cohesive space. I mean, people are speaking about it. There's been talk of it for years, but I would love there to be a, a space that was like, we've got, you know, there's a black cultural archives, but there to be spaces and hubs where, like the ICA, mm -hmm. somebody was saying, like the ICA, but it is basically around black arts. Right. To me, that'd be great. So it's a building that's not 
something that's going to be taken away by something it's black owned um i'd like to definitely see more sort of black um ownership and support of black ownership in that respect so the black pound days things like that those things which are happening i think those are really great and mm -hmm. useful for building intergenerational wealth yes. and building on economy and i think that's really important but an art space or having a number of art spaces that we work on those and we created those i think yeah those are great whenever those people are having those initiatives and working on them those are things we have to support and keep on so i mean i'm obviously coming from the arts perspective but and you're from the science perspective, but that there's no reason why those couldn't collide. And often they do, you know, science yeah. and arts, they yeah. do in lots yeah. of different ways. So a space that could be, that'd be brilliant hubs, yeah, around London, that'd be brilliant. Mate, sorry. I like the idea of, sorry, I like the idea of ownership, so it can't be taken away. But to, to make that, I would like to see equality. Mm -hmm. And I mean, not people giving me a handout. I don't need a handout. I just want same equal chance that everybody else has. And that will give us sustainability. Yeah. We will be around forever because our creativity is huge. To think of the boxes that people have been put into yeah. and how they've excelled. I mean, I think of Lewis Hamilton, who is just... A, and he's not been given his props. He is... He is the best driver ever, yet he's not being given his props. And also, he, he, he doesn't care what they say to him. They, when he, the last time he went, oh, when he finished the interview, oh, excuse me, opened up his top, he had his Nigeria on. He was told off because he was wearing about the Brianna t-shirt. He said, do what you like. I'm the top dog, you ain't gonna touch me, I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. That's, and I love that about him. Serena Williams, she has changed history yeah. when it comes to tennis yeah. playing, changed history. And yet they talk about her size, her bottom, her breast. The buggy has got to do with skills that woman had. So these are people that's excelled with all of this pressure on top of them. They weren't given anything, but in spite of it, I know why they don't want equality because I'd probably be frightened too. If people can do that, under so much pressure, the inventors that we've had, when they were enslaved and they can bring out all of this stuff, equality would be frightening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know what? I'm going to end on that note, right? Because I think that yeah. that is that's just the note to 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 push forward. You know what? It's been an absolute pleasure to have the two of you on here today. It's been- Fantastic way, it's great. It's, it's been absolutely brilliant. I, I, um, I, I can't tell you how, how much I've enjoyed this conversation. All right? It's only because we have our time limits why I'm stopping the conversation. Otherwise I know that we'll just carry on. Um, it's, just, it's just brilliant. Okay. And what we wanna do is, you know what? There was something that you said, right? Which was about mixing arts and science so absolutely when when lockdown finishes right and, and when covid's gone away I, w I don't know if i've got the power yet but i want to invite the two of you to imperial college and and okay. and we we put on some production i might even put we're there yeah, we yeah. are there. Wayne. Oh, we on are some kind of we've got our bag of ideas. We're yeah. ready yeah. because uh, we're uh, in we, all of what we are yeah. in all of what you guys do, and not enough is known about that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Not yeah. enough is known about that. You know about the black scientists and the work that you guys are doing. I mean, not enough is known. So yeah, we are we are right there. I'm there. I think it's fabulous. Yeah, Brilliant. let's connect us up. Definitely arts and science. Definitely yeah. arts and science. We I love that. Yeah. Can I hail up some people? Really? Car Brown, Dawn, Sarah, Zara. You guys are giving us so much love. I want to do this to you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Giving us loads of love, Suze. Loads and loads of love. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you all. We love it. Good. It's art been... and STEM. Def I, I like that. Somebody put we can have art um to STEM to have steam. That's and that's right. what we want because that's hot. That's red hot. That's hot. We like that. You see that the creativity is flowing already. <laughs> I'm loving it. The, yeah, the creativity. That's our resident wordsmith. That's that Sunday. Yeah. He he's got a proverb for every day of the week. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm loving it. Steam. Let's go for it. <laughs>
Let's team it up. Let's team it up. Let's team it up. I agree. Team it up. Steam it up, man. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, Fantastic. <laughs> right. I'm gonna just do my props for for for, for next week. Um, if I can find the, the presentation, but really and truly, it's just been absolutely amazing. Um, so let me just share my screen. Sorry, my face is hurting from smiling. <laughs> <laughs> it's been out today. I'm using those muscles. <laughs> it's right, work those cheeks, work them. Yeah, work them, work them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so okay, as I said. This week we've had Judith Jacob and Susan yes. Llewellyn, right? And they've been absolutely fantastic. Next week um, we will have, oops, sorry, going the wrong way, sorry. Next week we're going to have Yanni King, who was a former um, chair, uh, co chair of Imperial as One. So she's going to be coming, giving us some insight into her wonderful story as well. Um, and then if you've missed any of them, you can always see them on this YouTube, YouTube site um, belonging IAO. So please tune in and hopefully within the next couple of days, um, this interview will also be up there. So once again, I just want to say a big up to Judith and to Suzette. You're welcome. It's been absolutely wonderful Thank having you. both of you on here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.